Tastes Like War by Grace Cho is part food memoir, part sociological investigation, and wholly about a daughter's search through intimate and global history for the roots of her mother's schizophrenia. Grace learns to cook the dishes from her parents' childhood in order to invite the past into the present and to hold space for her mother's multiple voices at the table. Through careful listening over these shared meals, Grace discovers not only the things that broke the brilliant, complicated woman who raised her, but also the things that kept her alive. Hello and welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today I am so lucky to have another repeat guest joining me. Jasmine Vias, who first joined me on episode 59, is back today to once again challenge my understanding of the world with a book that examines mental illness in an immigrant family, how food plays a role in heritage, and the challenges of writing an honest but not exploitative memoir. I am a big fan of Jasmine's thoughtful book reviews, and I'm thrilled that she joined me today to talk about why Tastes Like War is the best book ever. Hi, Jasmine. Welcome back to the Best Book Ever podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me back. I'm thrilled to have you back. You're one of my favorite guests. Let's talk about your reading life. Since we last spoke roughly a year ago, tell me what your reading life has been like and has it has it changed at all? Um, I, I would say it's about the same. Um, I read a lot. I read for... Um, comfort, but I also tend to read like five or six books at the same time. And I'm kind of like, which one is my primary book? And so, but then I'll get into these kind of like, almost like shoots. I think of them as it's like, you're on a slide and you know, that one book just grabs you and, and you just like focus on that one book. I mean, at least in my reading life, that's, that's when I know I've hit a book that I really love is like, it pulls me into it. And then I just focus on that book. Um, and that's what happened with this book tastes like war. I believe I read this, um, early this year, but it really stuck with me. And, um, I just don't think it got the attention that it deserved. Um, and so I wanted to share it with, uh, with you and with your audience. I know from your wonderful Instagram account, Book Blanket for it, that you read very widely and you really focus on um, underrepresented authors. Mm-hmm. Um, have you noticed a change in who is being published over the last couple of years? And do you feel like the publishing industry is improving? It's, it's very hard to answer. The numbers are still pretty bleak as far as diversity. And then even when authors are published, um, there's a difference in the marketing dollars and efforts that are put behind um, underrepresented authors. And this is something that, you know, um, there are studies and things that I can point to. So that's one thing. Yes, there is a more being published and more stories are out there. But um, in order for those stories to hit like your Oprah magazine with, you know, summer reads or, you know, be kind of like um, prominently marketed, I just don't see enough of um, stories of people of color and, and underrepresented groups. Or the other thing that I see is like, an overrepresentation of one type of story. So like, for example, with India, um, you know, I'm Indian American and books um, related to India or related to Indian Americans tend to, I feel like overly focus on things like caste or like um, the subjugation of women. And um, there's like a few kind of like child marriage and stuff. And those are absolutely issues that need to be addressed. And I, and I want them to, you know, gain attention. Um, But I also think it's, um, it's frustrating when only certain types of stories from some groups come out. And so, um, and, and actually that does lead me to um, this, genre of books which i will call like food storytelling through food Mm -hmm. 
food is such a tangible thing. And so if you're like a mainstream publisher and you're trying to kind of pick which story you're going to publish and promote, um, my sense is that a lot of those gate- gatekeepers like food as um, as the kind of window because it's so tangible. Um, and it's something that I think people can experience, even if you haven't been to that country or if you're not too familiar with the culture. Um, and, um, and, you know, uh, it's too bad because there's other things I feel like to explore um, about different cultures that um, different cultures and also, um, you know, Americans who have roots in, in various cultures. But I will say that being said, this book, uh, Tastes Like War, really felt like the food food was really the lens through which this family lived its life and particularly the author's mother lived her life. And so I just found it very powerful. Um, and I also am one to seek out um, books about mental health and particularly um, memoirs about mental health. Why don't you tell our listeners what this one is about? Um, it is a memoir by, um, a Korean American woman. She is biracial. Her father is white and her mother is, um, a Korean immigrant. And she, the author is a sociologist and she tells the story of growing up with her mother, who was both this hugely resourceful woman and very vivacious and determined and also experienced um, mental health challenges that ultimately throughout her life, she sort of got worse and worse. And just by the end of her life was really barely able to function um, independently. And what I think is unique about this book is that the author herself, because she's a sociologist, is able to pull the, the threads of her mother's history as a, a war, you know, someone who experienced war and someone who experienced a lot of trauma, the loss of um, loved ones, loved ones disappearing. Um, and then um, combining that with their uh, living in this rural, uh, isolated place where they were really the one of the only families of color. Mm-hmm. Um, and she tells the story of very complicated family relationships uh, in a way that uh, touched me deeply. Before reading this, did you have any understanding of schizophrenia? Yeah, I had. Um, I uh, w- In my previous um, career, uh, well, as part of my career, I have worked with, um, worked on disability uh, cases. So like Uh, people who are facing mental health challenges. I uh, worked on uh, their benefits and um, various issues related to essentially government benefits for people with mental illness who were, uh, you know, so disabled that they were not able to um, work. And um, as part of this, I learned a lot about schizophrenia. And then I just, I also did my own reading. Like there's a book called The Collected Schizophrenias, which is by another Asian American author about her experience of schizophrenia and how she was treated throughout college and how the, her college sort of failed her in terms of supporting her and allowing, you know, accommodating her illness with respect to like her being able to graduate and so on. Mental health is an area that I just am really interested in. And um, I think that again, coming back to underrepresented groups, um, a lot of times uh, we don't really hear the stories of uh, people of color with uh, mental illness. Um, And so I, I, I often seek out these narratives. I'm so glad you used the word failure because that was exactly what I was thinking as I was reading this is this woman was failed every step of the way. And I couldn't help but wonder, I mean, it seems obvious that a white man would not have been failed like this woman was failed. Grace Cho's mother. Mm-hmm. I, um, I, I found it. So one of the things that I am interested in is like, what are available mental health resources that are out there? And one of the things that I found is um, primary, first of all, there's, there's most therapists and mental health practic- practitioners are white and there's just not a lot of people of color in general. 
So one of the things that was so heartbreaking in this book was that the author, uh, the author's mother finally was able to get a Korean uh, speaking woman to be her, you know, as a therapist. And she was like, oh, gosh, it's, you know, it's so nice to be able to talk to her because, you know, her mother was, for one thing, linguistically isolated. And then, of mm-hmm. course, was having um, some mental health struggles. Um, it, but then her father comes in and then, like, he basically Either it's not clear to the author, does the father end up having a personal relationship with what, this woman? Does he end up seeing her as a, like as a patient or what? But something the father intervened with the relationship between the mother and the therapist. And so like that one lifeline that she could have had was then severed. Um, and, you know, I think that um, when it comes to mental health and therapy and stuff, it's nice to have, um, you know, someone with cultural competence. But in addition, if you're, uh, if you don't speak English, I mean, to have someone who can speak to you in the language that you're comfortable in, I mean, I can only, um, you know, it feels like that's like a necessity for, uh, for many people to even be able to get uh, the, the help and the relief that they need. I love that, that what you just said, cultural competence. That's so good because it is her her experience was so unique, particularly for that town where they live, this little town where Grace Cho says they're the only immigrant family in the town for a mm-hmm. long time. And to be understood by someone who you're not going to have to explain your background to, mm-hmm. that's a huge hurdle to go yeah. in with that already, that footing already in place. Mm-hmm when she lost that connection, it broke my heart. Yeah. And it was, um, I, uh, one of the things that the author was talking about in the book was how she tried to get her mother help. And like, she, she, as a child, like did all these things to try to get help. And it was so, it was so powerful and also so heartbreaking to think of a child just, Mm -hmm. okay, let me think of anything I can do. And, um, and to, just the isolation of this family, I think, was one of the things that really struck me. But essentially, the family, the families who were sending their children to um, the United States. Oh, here it is. Um, in the minds of many Koreans, America became a mythical place, place where there was no poverty or racism and anyone could make it big. In the words of one woman who gave her two Amer- Amerasian children up for adoption. One time, my older one came home with his trousers st- soaked and frozen with his own pee. Children bullied him by saying, you must have a, a big penis. Let me see. I talked to them for about a month and said, we have been waiting for a long time for your father who has never come. If you stay here, you will face constant discrimination. However, in the U.S., there is no such thing. This was from a, a, a Korean woman who was in Korea, who um, I believe the father of the children was a G, American GI, a white GI. Um, and so, do, you know, this one of the things that this book does is really dig into not only the story of um, the author and her own family, but also other families who um, some of whom made the heart wrenching decision to send their children to the United States to be adopted um, just because they, they had this sense of like hopelessness. And um, I mean, sad to say a false um, kind of perception that in the United States, there would be no poverty, there would be no racism and, and that their kids would be happier. Um, when in fact, sadly, you know, a lot of them actually struggled, um, maybe just as much or, or sometimes even more. Yeah. And I think Grace Cho makes a really compelling argument that the, this disease is not only biological, but it's also a social disease. What she means by that is that the traumatic circumstances can, I I don't think she uses the word cause it, but definitely contribute Mm -hmm. to the development of this disease. That's what I mean when I, I kept feeling like she was so utterly failed because even Grace Cho, when she thinks about her mother and she says, this is what I know and this is what I don't know. And and her mom was 
very private about what had happened to her in her youth. Mm -hmm. And all she knows essentially is that there were terrible traumas. She thinks she knows what they were and we think we know, but I had never thought of it in those terms before that, that trauma can inform and lead to a disease. Mm -hmm. There were so many places where you think like, Oh, if we if if someone could have helped her at this point, mm-hmm. or at this point, or at this one, a haul along the way, a lot of things would have turned out differently. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think you make a good point about um, what makes this author unique and what makes this book unique, which is it's not only the story of this family, but also like you're saying, um, her research into the social forces that can affect mental health, um, mental health treatment outcomes. What I found it, yes, it was heartbreaking, but there was so much vivaciousness and like real drive and determination on the part of her mother, particularly when she was younger and, you know, able to be more functional that I just found, um, inspiring. And, um, I'm gonna, if you can humor me, I'm going to read another passage because this book just has so many great, great passages. Um, So in my lifetime, I've had at least three mothers, and the author then goes on to describe the first mother. Uh, The first was a mother of my childhood. I adored and admired her, my beautiful mama, a charismatic and savvy micropolitician. She fought tirelessly to gain acceptance in my father's rural hometown, and in doing so, made life more livable for her children. Food was her first line of defense against a deep and abiding fear of the other that permeated the collective unconsciousness of the white working class community in which we landed. Um, And then it goes on to say that, you know, she was a forager. She would like cook these delicious dishes. I know earlier on, I did say that food as a storytelling um, device is, is, can be cliche um, or, or sometimes it's cliche or forced, but it does also, this passage makes me think like, yeah, you know, food really does connect people and it is a way you know, when somebody is in a community and they're isolated, food can be one thread of connection for them to kind of um, insert themselves or, or, or interact with a community. Is that why, do you think that's why so many immigrant memoirs or immigrant stories frequently focus on food and the recollection of food uh, recipes and family stories related to them? Um, I partly, yes. So mm. partly I do think food, you know, I think all of us have seen Ratatouille and where the, <laughs> you know, the, the critic eats the bite of the food and he's transported back to childhood. And we all have those moments where we eat that thing or we smell that thing and we're really taken back. And actually now it reminds me of another podcast episode that you had when you talked to those three cookbook authors Yes, and you guys were talking about how food brought them together. So I, Yes, it's definitely something that um, that pulls us together and that tells a story. But I also think that there is a lot of gatekeeping in the publishing world. And there are a lot of stories out in the world. But what comes to us in the form of, you know, an actual publish, published and bound book that's then marketed and so on and that we hear about um, in that process, I feel like food stories are overrepresented because they're easy, easier to market and easier to tell than some other aspects of culture that are maybe either unfamiliar or just, or esoteric and and not easy to package in like in an Instagram post or something, you know? I see your point. So it's, I, I'm sure it's very easy to lean on that because they think, well, food is appealing to everyone. Right. But it is one aspect of the story. Yeah. Mm. And so, you know, I, I, I hope that as time goes on, we'll see an opening up of more different lenses in which to, you know, through which to look at and learn about other stories that maybe, you know, we, that aren't being heard right now or aren't being amplified. Have you read um, Hidden Valley Road? I haven't, but I, that's, that one's like, it's on my radar. I just, I haven't gotten to it yet. Have you read it? 
I just read it for an upcoming episode of the podcast. Oh. In fact, I read it right after I read Tastes Like War. And basically, if you have a mental illness, it was your mother's fault at the oh time. Oh, my gosh. And after reading these two books in a row, I just felt very, very stabby about uh -huh. how we treat women, mm -hmm. particularly women of color, when it comes to issues of mental illness, because it is seen as a moral failing as opposed to either a biological disease or a social disease, as, as the argument that Grace Cho makes. What the medical and psychological kind of field does, that is, is not, un, I mean, that's biased, right? That's affected by bias. And so, you know, the, it's something that, again, brings to mind, like, the people at the table or the people who are who are in the mental health field, like, need to have, we it needs to have diversity, right? So that yeah. a broad uh, group can be represented and, and maybe um, some of these biases can be questioned. Um, but there's also the, the thing of, like, the wanting to blame, wanting to have a reason, you know? Yes. And I, and it's very sad to me that, um, and frustrating that in the case of, you know, these uh, children, that it was the mother that was blamed and it was, oh, the mother did this. And it's like, it's like, you can't, right. I, I mean, I think being a woman in America right now, you just feel like, well, you can't win. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you vote, you, you know, voice your opinions, you whatever, but, you know, women are still paid less. Like we've had the, um, the Roe versus Wade was overruled and that's been, you know, a, a very painful thing for many women to accept. Um, and so, um, it's just, it's, it's sad to me and it's also frustrating. Um, but you know, I guess, um, then the, the ray of hope to me is like, okay, we can talk about it. We can challenge it. We can kind of investigate these things, um, rather than just accepting them. Yeah. Anytime we're shining a light on how people are othered, I mean, there's, they're baby steps, but I think they're important steps because, well, if a woman is experienced mental health issues, well, she's just hysterical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> if a woman of color yeah. is experiencing it, we other her even farther and say, well, that's cultural. Mm -hmm. And if a man is experiencing it, it's the mother's fault. And every single time we are pushing women into this box of, you know, bitches are crazy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah, y'all are making us crazy. <laughs> I mean, and it's, you know, it's also the labeling, right? It's like, well, oh, you're not, you know, you're not passionate. You're not like a lead or you're not strident or whatever. You're, you're crazy. And it's right. Like, well, why, why is that what we call it? You know, after I read this, I went on a Google dive of Grace Cho and I found some pictures of her mother online that she, you know she has shared as she describes at the beginning of the book you use the word vivacious you can just tell by looking at the pictures that she's the woman you would go stand next to at the party uh -huh. you know she's got that just energy you can tell she's funny you can tell she's she's probably would be that person who served a great dinner and told phenomenal stories and there's i mean it's it's awful in every situation but to put a face to this particular disease and to look at her, you just thought, God, we really lost, we really lost something important when we lost this woman. We lost a interesting person. Okay. Like, let me shift gears a little bit to true crime, right? Okay. So true crime, I am, I don't like it because I feel like it's opportunistic because it's, you know, someone's loved one has died or been kidnapped and so on. And it's like, people are just gleefully like eating popcorn and, you know, learning about it. So to put that onto this book, I mean, I, I want to, I, I want to read to develop empathy and compassion. And I don't want to veer into like, oh, I'm watching a car crash or I'm watching a train wreck. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, and, and I think that what this book does really well is, um, the author tells a complicated story of the mother who's just like this vivacious woman and she's been through so much and yet she still figures out how to like 
you know, within her limited means, like able to make decisions um, and and live this really powerful life. Um, And then, you know, sadly, you know, her mental health takes a turn and then she's, she kind of goes downhill in terms of her health. Um, But I think that through reading this book, it's like, she, she lives on in a way, you know, like Mm -hmm. there, there is meaning she has left an impact on this world. Um, and you know, uh, as much as we wish she would have been able to get the help that would have allowed her to live a a longer and, and, you know, more, um, independent life, uh, you know, at least it's like, at least we're learning about her now, at least we're learning about a war that, um, I think a lot of people didn't really know about or, or didn't know much about, which is a Korean war. Do you feel like the, the potential for exploitation is mitigated by the fact that it was written by her daughter, or do you think those also can veer into exploitation the way a true crime story can? Um, I, I think the way that this author has uh, treated the subject is very respectful and very, one thing that I liked is that it's such a complicated story, even the relationship with the father, which we haven't even gotten into in this conversation is so complicated. Um, but she, I think is, is very fair, um, and very respectful to her, her, you know, to her family while also being, um, honest and, and, revealing, you know, the messy sides of, of her life. You know, when I look at publishing in general, I feel like there is this kind of push to make people reveal maybe more than they're comfortable with, or make people reveal like salacious details or something. Um, and, and so I, I think it can happen in books generally. I don't think it happened here. I think this book does a good job of both telling the ugliness, but also telling the beauty in the story and being respectful to her subjects while also being very honest. Well, and she doesn't ever try to tell what she doesn't know. She's very candid about um, the things that she does not understand. And she doesn't make up. My mother was thinking this when she said the neighbor was following her. She has no idea what her mother was thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, I think that's where it, she keeps it from being voyeuristic as she's just saying, this was my experience of my mother. And I think that's what reading books like this um, has taught me, not just, you know, memoirs about uh, uh, mental illness, but um, literary fiction as well, that there's so much complication in life. And sometimes, you know, a story is not always linear. Sometimes you get stories, bits and pieces Mm -hmm. from an interaction with somebody. Sometimes people are inconsistent. Sometimes, you know, the same person can be amazing and and horrible, like within the same short timeframe. And and I think, you know, as we go through life, like that's, that also gives us a way to look at um, other people is like, everyone has their great moments and everyone has their moments where they're ugly and, you know, um, and that's just part of this whole, uh, you know, experience that is life. Now, when you picked up your book, I saw a whole bunch of, um, tabs in there. (laughs) What, what did you mark? So I just happened to open up to this tab, which says, which references the author's first book, which was about the ghosts of the Korean war. Um, and she, and she researched and wrote about the Korean War, um, she says, as a way to try to answer the questions that no one was willing to answer for her. And a lot of times when we um, read these history books, like they're written by someone who is outside of the community. And I think that having this, having Grace Cho author that book as the, you know, the child of a survivor of the war, I think brought some um, nuance to the book. Um, and also, uh, I thought it was interesting how Grace brings in dreams a lot in this book. And also, I believe she weaved them through her research about the Korean War and the effect of dreams. And it's like, it does bring something meaningful to the picture. And I think um, some would have dismissed that as not valuable, but I like how she brought out the value and the meaning even of people's dreams 
um, and how that said something about their experience. Yeah. And it's another part of the illustration that war is absolutely unending for the people who have experienced it. Even yeah. in many ways, even their rest is never restful. That's you know, a really good point. Yeah. I didn't even think about it that way, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, and so bringing in another book, um, there's a book called what my bones know, which is by, um, Stephanie Fu and it's a memoir of recovering from complex PTSD. Mm. And she was, um, she is also an Asian American and she's not Korean, but, um, she was raised in an abusive family and she talks about going back to her high school and how in her high school, there were a lot of students who were children of refugees and the teachers didn't really seem to be aware of or to look for the fact that many of these students were struggling. Um, and it was maybe because um, they were seen as a model minority because they were Asian American, that they were kind of not fitting the image or the picture of what a teacher would have thought of as a child who was experiencing trouble at home. But, you know, you think about um, how many people in this world and, and in our country who are, who have experienced war or who are connected to someone who's experienced war. And that it just makes me think about like what unseen effects are operating on people's lives that maybe um, we don't appreciate or, or don't talk about. Well, I want to ask you, um, both times you've been on the show, you've chosen to talk about nonfiction, even though I know from your Instagram that you do read a lot of fiction. So mm -hmm. is this a coincidence that both times we've talked, it's been nonfiction or does nonfiction hit you differently? Um, memoirs hit me differently, but um, in general, I, I'm... I read a mix. I would say I read more fiction than nonfiction. I read a lot of historical fiction. I read literary fiction and then um, children's books and then the occasional graphic novel um, and then a lot of memoirs and then some mental health books. This is the best part of all of it. What are you reading right now? I uh, read a lot of different books at the same time. And then when there's one book that like really grabs my attention, then that will be my primary focus. So okay. a book that I just got from the library is Set Boundaries, Find Peace is the name of the book. Um, so that's that's one that I'm looking, like I'm about to dig into. Um, it's a and one that I'm, it is nonfiction. It's written by a therapist mm. and it's all about boundaries. And I think, you know, as women um, who are doing many things in life, sometimes setting boundaries is, is an area where, uh, it helps to, you know, have some language and have some understanding around how to do that better. Um, but also one that I'm almost finished with is um, 10 Steps to Nanette by um, Hannah Gadsby. Oh, how is it? I saw this on your Instagram, I think. It's so good. It's so good. Um, the first one third, she talks about her childhood and I felt like it dragged a little bit. Um, but as she got more to like her middle school and high school years, um, and then she gets into like her, uh, how she got into comedy and how she um, developed an understanding of herself as a neurodiverse person, a person with autism. Um, it was really good. And one thing that I'm really interested in is the story. It's just storytelling in general. And she, as you know, if you've seen any of her comedy specials, is a brilliant storyteller. And she talks in this book about how she got to the point of building what, you know, uh, her huge Netflix special that, that, caused her to go viral, which was Nanette. Mm -hmm. um, and it really shows you how um, along the way in life, you just have so many bumps and bruises and things that don't turn out the way you want and feeling like you don't fit in or, you know, you're not getting where you want to be. And, but then you can look back and, you know, um, as Hannah Gatsby did, and she put it together in this story that, um, that made an impact on the world and that really got people thinking. And so, um, I highly recommend that one and I reading it as an audiobook. So she's, she reads it herself, which is wonderful. Oh, I bet that's great. I'm always looking for that book that will change my life. Right. Particularly. I like memoirs where people get ugly and messy. Will you tell my listeners where they can find you? Yes. Um, they can find me on at book blanket fort 
at it's um that's my Instagram handle. And then I also read and review books um, on Goodreads and on Storygraph, also under Book Blanket Fort. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. It is always so fun talking to you. And um, I always look forward to hearing what you read. So I hope you'll come back anytime you have oh a book my you gosh. Me about. That's so nice of you, Julie. I really appreciate you reading the book. And, you know, you had some great insights that I wasn't really focused on. Um, and so I appreciated uh, and enjoyed our conversation as well. Links to everything we discussed are in the show notes or at my website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. You can find me on Instagram at bestbookeverpodcast. If you have a book you want to tell me about, click on the Be a Guest button on my website or Instagram bio so we can chat. Remember, if you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with someone you love and rate it on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to hit the follow or subscribe button. Thank you for joining me today. And I will see you at the library.